we are uh, at Christ Fellowship Presbyterian. And background noise is great. Thank you for the music, but cut your phones off. Cut your phones off. Um, and so now we're in John chapter 21. We're in John chapter 21. And um, we've been talking together since Easter on the appearances of Jesus because, are you listening? Because in the gospel accounts, it is, Paul says to us, it is the death of Jesus Christ for our sins on the cross. It is his burial. It is his rising again on the third day and finally his appearances. If you, if you don't co quite connect with the appearances of Jesus Christ, you have missed out on the fact that this is also part of the gospel account. It is factual, not only scriptural, but it is factual as well. And so I take you to John chapter 21. And in order for you to get there with me, John chapter 21, verse 1, um, I, want to, I want to back up just a moment to John chapter 20. Because in John chapter 20, in verse 19, on the evening of Easter day, Jesus comes and appears to his disciples in the closed, locked room where they were, probably the upper room where they had, had uh, the Lord's Last Supper and Passover Seder meal together. The doors were locked, but he comes anyway, uh, appears among them. That's his appearance, in essence, with the disciples as they were gathered as a whole there. And finally, the second appearance in in John 20, verse 24, Thomas, one of the 12, was not there for that first meeting. <laughs> and so in his doubts, Jesus comes again and appears with them and shares with Thomas. And Thomas believes him and says to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says to him in verse uh, 29, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's you. That's me. Weren't there in that upper room. Haven't been there in those 40 days that Jesus was appearing after his resurrection, before his ascension. We weren't there. But do you believe that he rose from the dead? Yes. Well, you know, you can't get there from here, I'm convinced, without the interaction of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because his job is to make this understandable and real to us. This whole message today, by the way, can only be understandable with us if we get connected with the Holy Spirit. So you can't see his presence, but that doesn't have anything to do with it. His mind can move in your mind. God's appearance can be here, though we don't see him. I would love to have had an appearance of Jesus uh, as I stood with that group of disciples in that upper room, but you know... Uh, that wasn't our place. That wasn't our time. Now, we're looking for other appearances of Jesus Christ with us by means of his invisible and yet powerful Holy Spirit. So I would ask you in this time frame, this message this morning, with all that you've maybe gone through to get here, <laughs> some of you more than others, but I would ask for you to just go ahead and ask the Holy Spirit to get you connected with this message from the Word of God, that you not be someplace else. You know how important it is that you be here, but you also know how, how easy it is to be someplace else while somebody's trying to talk to you. <laughs> so connect yourself now, all right? And I'm assigning uh, this first row up here, on this row, this row up here, to take care of Parker. All of you have the job, okay, so you all see to it now, okay? All right. Now, now in that light, uh, in John 21, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, which is the Sea of Galilee, just a different name. And he revealed himself in this way. So he's going to tell us a story about the fact that Jesus has come yet again, <laughs> the third time, to talk with his disciples. And it was really essential. The first time had its purpose, obviously. The second time had its purpose, obviously. And the third time, here's the purpose. Keep reading with me. In verse 2. 
So Simon Peter and Thomas, called the twin, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, which would have been, you remember, you remember the fishermen who fished with Peter and Andrew, uh, John and James. John the fisherman is the man who, as an apostle, is writing the Gospel of John that we're reading right now. And so he went with Peter, and two others of the disciples were together with Simon Peter, and he said to them, I'm going fishing. <laughs> and they said to him, we'll go with you. This wasn't a man who was trying to figure out what bait to use on a rod so that he could catch a bass for dinner. This is not that guy. This is the man who made a living fishing commercially in the Sea of Galilee. In fact, bless his heart, he's so famous as the fisherman of the Sea of Galilee that if you would visit Israel and go to the Sea of Galilee, you could actually buy a plate of St. Peter's fish, which is just, I'm, I'm told, uh, freshwater tilapia. And the Sea of Galilee apparently is rich in those. And um, everybody who visits the Sea of Galilee, I suppose, in Peter's name, has to eat a tilapia, <laughs> I suppose. That's St. Peter's fish, it's called. Well, um, that didn't exactly draw me to it. But nonetheless, what I'm saying to you is, he's a commercial fisherman. And um, he decided to, to begin business again. Peter, I'll remind you, Peter and Andrew and John and James were all part of the Zebedee Fishing Company, Zebedee, Zebedee being John and James's daddy. Apparently he owned the company and all these men were part of, partners with him. Um, and he says, I'm going fishing. And they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. It's not easy, I'm sure, being a commercial fisherman who says, I'm through with this whole discipleship business. <laughs> I've got to go do something for a living for my family. I can understand that. When I got out of seminary, uh, four long years of listening to people tell me how expert they were um, and reading more books, we had people come to the seminary from medical school who would be amazed at the reading that was required of us every single day that we were in school. Uh, the volumes that we had to buy was a major expense of our education. And most of them denying what I believe was true. <laughs> and so nonetheless, nonetheless, in the midst of all of that, um, we got through with four years of seminary and all of the Presbyterian churches of the South came to see us. Uh, most of them from North Carolina. You know. Little churches, little buildings, trying to hire young little pastors. And you know, you know, I just wasn't into little churches. Why are you all laughing? So um, I was from uh, northern Missouri and um, my dad was a contractor, and that's how I worked my way through college, working with him, and so uh, I just felt inclined. I'm not sure whether I felt lit or not, but I was right up to here <laughs> with the whole seminary Presbyterian church education program. Thank you very much. I could not take another day. So they tried to convince me, or they didn't do a great job of it, but they were wondering if I could not stay and work on a, another degree and I said, oh, man, <laughs> I'm degreed out. I think, I think I've done nothing in my life so far but be in school, you know. And uh, so my wife, who was a, a teacher, elementary school teacher, uh, and I made up her minds to go back to my hometown um, in Missouri. And uh, we, we lived there for several years. I, I contracted with my dad. I had no idea, had no desire whatsoever, thank you very much, to be in a Presbyterian pulpit again for however long. I didn't know how long that was going to last. But my, uh, my father, because he knew I had come to Christ in uh, Elmwood Presbyterian Church in my hometown, little, little church again. I seem to be stuck with little churches in my lifetime. And so anyway, I had come to Christ there, and they, they didn't have a pastor, and 
my dad sat in coffee with somebody who was an elder in that church and said, you know, Ed's coming back to town. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, he's, uh, he's got a degree and he's been to Presbyterian Seminary. And, you know, this guy said, well, that's really interesting. We need a pastor. So about, I was in town maybe two hours from Richmond, Virginia. I traveled all that way to get back to Missouri and with a U-Haul trailer behind us. And um, sitting in my house, my, my mother, my, my grandmother, excuse me, uh, owned the house next door. And she was long gone to glory by then, and they, they had worked to put us in that house, and so there we were. Am I keeping you up? This is kind of a long story, and it? Just bear with me here. And um, so there we resided, and I was in town sweeping the floors for about two hours, and my, my mother said, I need to tell you something <laughs> that your dad has done. <laughs> now, this is my father who was a contractor and could not care less about church. Thank you very much. I'm not sure my father ever heard me preach one sermon. I don't think he ever did. Um, I don't that, that I recall at least. And uh, so, because church was wasn't his thing, fishing was his thing, duck hunting was his thing. But you know, uh, church was not high on the list. Came on the wrong day. You know, because uh, he didn't know there was a right day for church. So he uh, got me condemned to a phone call from a Presbyterian elder or two that said, Ed, we understand that you are now home and graduated from seminary. Isn't that wonderful? Can you come to preach? And, uh, well, yeah, it was the church where I'd come to Christ. They got me started out, you know, loving the Bible. I know it's hard to believe, but Presbyterians do love the Bible and uh, do come to Christ, as I did. And we just baptized funny, that's all. And uh, so... I had to say, okay, yes. And so I did. And I was there for a long time, quite a, well, some time, until a full-time pastor could be brought in and hired there. And um, I was contracting every day of the week, and on weekends I got to go uh, preach in a Presbyterian church. And uh, when that ended, lo and behold, the Presbyterian came to me and said, well, now, now that you're through with that, uh, we've got another place to assign you. Would you like three small Presbyterian churches out in the country uh, where you get to travel out there? Uh, you got a Jeep, right? Yeah, I've got a, yeah. Well, that's what we need. <laughs> we, we, we need a guy who's uh, graduated from seminary, is a Presbyterian minister, has a Jeep, has his own job because we're not going to pay you anything. And there you uh, And, you know, there was many days there where I... I thought, I thought, I thought I told you to control Parker. <laughs> Bless his heart. Uh, he, he lets me know when my illustrations are entirely too long. Move on, Ed. And so I sometimes felt during that period of time, I thought what I was saying to God is, I'm going to go fishing. <laughs> Had enough of theology. Thank you very much. I'm going to go do something else. For a living, and I meant every word of it. Well, you know, funny thing about this, sometimes we plan and God laughs. Sure, go on to Missouri. I'll follow you wherever you go. <laughs> oh yeah, don't like, don't want to be in the predatory ministry the rest of your life. Don't want to be called reverend. Don't want to be okay. That's fine with me. I'll use you there. And he did. And those churches grew, and uh, Ruby was busy teaching at one point along the way, and both of us busy, busy, busy. That was a long time before we had any children, of course. And uh, so I understand, Peter. I understand, Peter. Three years of dealing every day with the realities of eternity, it can wear you out. Three years of dealing with theology and standing up to the Jewish leadership who didn't want anything to do with Jesus and therefore they didn't want anything to do with you either. I can understand. They would be a wearing proposition, can't you? Yeah. Now, here's the problem. Verse 4 of John 21, just as day was breaking. Remember where these guys have been all night? Yep, out 
there fishing. You know how they fished. No rod, no bait, no, 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 no. Nets, throwing those nets, throwing those nets, all night long, throwing nets, pulling them back in by hand, getting nothing. Pretty sad night. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. This happens a lot, by the way, after his resurrection. He looked different. He just looked different. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? <laughs> Sometimes God does have a sense of humor. Got any fish out there after all night fishing? I got any fish out there? Oh, I don't have a thing. No. He said to them, well, cast the net on the right side of the boat. And you will find some. <laughs> like I say, you got to read this in the right light. It's just funny. <laughs> These guys have been fishing all night long. Do you think they might have forgotten to cast the net on the right side of the boat? Seriously? Are you kidding? They've been fishing left, right, up, down, in, out, you know, every which way they could. And they were getting nothing because God was not in it. God not in it. So casting it on the right side. And they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, which is how John refers to himself, his name is not in this book anywhere, but this is always how he refers to himself. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now, what could have alerted John? Since they couldn't recognize this guy standing over there on the shoreline, what could have alerted John? This has got to be the Lord by the quantity of fish. But that leads to another story. So just bear with me. Hang on to John chapter 21 and go with me to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. And, and uh, Simon Peter had already had an encounter with Jesus in his own house, he lived in Capernaum with his brother Andrew and their families. It was kind of a joint situation there, a little compound, which, by the way, archaeologists believe, at least, that they have found the location of Peter's house <laughs> on the shore of the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum. And, um, and uh, th by the way, as in most situations now in Palestine, if they find a site that Jesus inhabited or was there or Peter or somebody, there's a church built over now. <laughs> and sure enough, a very interesting church. It looks like a spaceship that, that, because it sits upon legs over this place, the house, foundations and walls. And, uh, and so, okay, uh, in, in Luke 4, just back up with me a little bit, uh, in verse 38, he rose, that is, Jesus rose, left the synagogue, that's in Capernaum, and he entered Simon's house. And Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. And then he, then he ministers to the whole little city of Capernaum that night after the Sabbath day is finished with healings. Well, now, in light of that, I go to Luke 5, verse 1. You still with me here so far? You're looking a little dowdy here. I'm just checking on you to make sure you're still with me here. Uh, people online, I'm sure, are listening with bated breath, and I want you to just sort of sit on the edge of your seat and act like you're interested, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And so people right, online right now, aren't you, aren't, don't you know they're saying to themselves, what kind of a church is that? <laughs> what are they doing over there? Luke 5, verse 1. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that's yet another name for the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets, and getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. You know how, have you been on a lake where somebody could actually stand in a boat on the lake and you could hear them when you're on the shore everything they said even though they're half a mile out there yeah because the, the lake uh, the water allows volume 
And so he was able to sit on the lake and talk to the people on the shore. They could hear everything he said without amplification. So there he is. And when he finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Well, Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I'll let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking, and they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats, so they both began to sink. <laughs> That's a lot of fish. I've told you the story enough, I know, that you've already memorized it, but let me say it to you one more time. They found a first century fishing boat on, this, on the floor of the Sea of Galilee and encased it with uh, epoxy and brought it up uh, off the bottom, and it's now in a museum there near the Sea of Galilee in the Israeli Museum. And uh, that boat is something like, if I recall the dimensions, 27 feet long, 4 feet wide, gunwales, or, or 10 feet wide, excuse me, and the gunwales are like 4 feet high. This is, it would take fish, friends, to fill that sucker up. That boat was full of fish, and they filled two of them up with fish. Amazing, isn't it? Caught nothing all night. And Jesus stands on your boat, and suddenly, you're a fisherman. Suddenly, this is worth all your time. See, that's what happens when you listen to people preach. You see, it's worth all your time. Just keep that in mind. So they began to sink. But when Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And he who all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, because, listen, friends, it's the Zebedee Fishing Company. And so Jesus said to Simon, interesting words, do not be afraid. This big guy, hardened kind of guy, with calloused hands, Never been on his knees to anybody in his entire lifetime. Realizes by the conviction of God on him. I'm in the presence of someone whom I cannot deny. I cannot get past this man. He comes to my home and he heals my mother-in-law. He stands on my boat and preaches the word of God. He fills up my boats with fish because the fear is not because he's has a lot of fish. You can imagine the number of fish he had to squat down in when he got on his knees in the boat. No, his fear was, this man wants me. This guy comes from God, and God wants me. Do not fear. From now on, you'll be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Are you listening? How much do you think they left? Luke says it was everything. Left their boats, left the fish, and they followed him. You and I both know that's not easy. I told you my little saga, going to my hometown. I was perfectly happy in my hometown, thank you very much. I had two parents across the street who were looking out for us, you know. Um, my relatives were in town. Uh, my wife with me. I had no troublesome children. <laughs> Came home from a fall, beautiful fall day, having poured yards of concrete with my little dad and my crew, and sitting on that porch of my grandmother's house. Took off my boots, relaxed there with a beautiful fall, sunshiny day. Looking out across the street to my parents' home, 
in a town that I had been raised in and I loved and I love it to this very day. The Lord said to me, these are the golden years. Enjoy them now. They'll be gone soon. Well, I didn't want to hear that. Because I was young enough that I thought all things would continue as they are now. And nothing ever remains the same. little item when my wife and I bought a house in Chattanooga uh, in the backyard that um, stood on a little pedestal out in the backyard a uh, little sundial with a little phrase on it you know they all come with little phrases on them you know it said to me at that time something very negative time takes everything but memory I didn't want to hear that either. But you know, I've lived a few years. I've watched time take everything but memories. Boy, you don't have to be too old, I realize, to realize this, but maybe I was old enough to realize this. You've only got a certain amount of time and the memories you have, and the parents you have, and the people you have, and the friends you have, and the future you have, and the job you have, and the thoughts you have, <laughs> and the health maybe even you have, you don't have them forever. You do not. People, things pass away. Only God lives above time and history. But we're caught in it, aren't we? And our days are numbered. Our days are numbered. I'm back in John chapter 21. <clears throat> so in, in John 21 verse 7, it's the Lord, and when Simon Peter heard it, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work. That means he was naked, and apparently he didn't want to appear before the Lord uh, stripped, so he puts on a coat and throws himself into the lake and swims. To, to Jesus. He was stripped for work, threw himself into the sea, and the other disciples came in the boat. Of course they did, because they had some common sense. Dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. And when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Where did he get that fish? You know, the funny thing about Jesus is the fish might not listen to you, but they listen to him. And so he had fish on the fire. And Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore. Because Jesus said, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon brought it all ashore, full of large fish. And you know Simon's a fisherman because they counted 153. <laughs> a fisherman was writing this book, you see, John. So they counted those fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. <laughs> come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This is now the third time that Jesus revealed to the disciples, was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. You remember how the chapter started? Jesus revealed himself. Now, some of you will have a version that says he manifested himself, and that's the same word. Uh, but the word revealed here is used from the Greek text because, well, if you need an encounter with God, God comes and reveals himself. Now, this is not too spiritual to understand this. When you've gotten to the end of yourself at times, and I hope that it's been more than once in your life, because most human beings need it far more than once or ten times. When you get to the end of yourself, and you decide that life is not worth it, 
and life is not wonderful and it's never going to be, and you start to pray with essence, with struggle, with motivation, with, by the way, depression, or the end of all things, God comes. Nobody's ever going to be saying to me much, I think. Oh, yeah, I was praying in my room, and Jesus walked in the room and said, Hey, how you doing? Can I have a cup of coffee? No. He doesn't bother with that stuff. The Spirit of God just comes. And begins to talk to you. Begins to talk into your mind. Interrupt the flow of bad thoughts. Interrupts the flow of depression. Stops the strain of life. It's amazing how it can freeze. All around you, too busy, too busy, and life can freeze in place because God's come. And he says, he says to us, like Jesus said to his disciples after the crucifixion and the resurrection, peace be with you. Well, that's my problem. I don't have any. That's why he walks in. You don't have any peace. Or if you have peace today, believe me, give it the afternoon. It'll dissipate somewhere along the line. It's not something we own. It's something God owns. And he gives it as he will. You may be full of anxiety today. You look kind of sane. But you may be full of struggles and thoughts that you're not sharing because you don't want anybody to know or the anxieties that you have about something or some things or somebody or maybe just you. Boy, life is just full of struggles in the corner, aren't they? Where you paint yourself in and can't figure out how to get back out. Life is full of those kinds of angles. And yet, Peter's decided the way out for him is I gotta get back to something concrete, you know. I gotta get back to something like going to construction work in northern Missouri. You know? I gotta I gotta do something where when I get through with a job, that sucker's done. I can just walk away, you know. I can't walk away from ministry. Can't solve people, that's for sure. People are always the problems, aren't they? And so you get through with one issue, there's always another one. Just I don't say stand around and wait on it because that'd be depressing. But I'm just simply saying life's always got an issue. If you solve that one, there's another one down the road. You just, that's how it is. That's how it is. No wonder, no wonder your grandmother and grandfather said to you one day, "I'm ready to go home to heaven." <laughs> and you were saying, "Well, that's terrible. <laughs> you, know, you shouldn't do that." My mother said to me at 88 years of age, "I don't want to be 90." <laughs> said, "Well, that's awful." <laughs> She was sitting in my home in Chattanooga, and she said, I don't want to be 90. I'm, I'm already 88. I can't believe I'm that old. <laughs> I said, well, I can. What happens, what happens to the rest of us if you leave us before you're 90? And she says, well, you're going to be okay. I don't want to be a burden to my family. And I can see I'm going to be a burden to my family as I get older. No kidding. I just didn't know she noticed You might be old, but it doesn't mean you're stupid. So she was sitting in a recliner that Ruby and I bought for her, especially because she was coming to town and we wanted her to be comfortable. So she loved recliners, and we bought a recliner. And she was sitting, and she had this conversation, long conversation with me, as I recall, that particular day. Don't want to be 90. Okay, Mom. The next day she was going to come hear me preach at this church. And she didn't make it. My sister called me while we were getting ready to start church here uh, that day, and she said, uh, we're taking Mom to Memorial Hospital, to the emergency room. And, and, of course, they did. And she came through that just fine. And um, a short time later, as they got back to northern Missouri, or middle Missouri, um, she had a stroke, and uh, that led to a lot of other things. If some of you have been through this with parents, you understand the flow of that. Doctors and hospital and 
a place to go because you can't hire a full-time nurse, you know, at home. And so, and, th and then every day after that, it's, I'd like to go home. Take me on home. I don't want to be here. I don't like, I don't like these places. Have you ever met an elderly person and said, boy, I really like this place? No, I've never met one. Because it's not how, it's not the home. It's not where they want to be. And so, two years. Two years of struggle. Mostly on my sister and her husband. I was here. They were there. And every day, every single day, my sister was there to take care of her, to see what was happening. And she had a full-time job as, as, this, uh, as the administrative assistant to the commissioner of the state of Missouri. And, and I, can, I can't imagine all she had to do every day. But every day she would go see what mom was doing, how she was. And uh, on my mother's 90th birthday, just about an hour, maybe a little bit more than that after midnight, on her 90th birthday, I got the call. Well, by golly, she really didn't want to be 90. That woman had a will. <laughs> wow. So I was pondering on that situation because, my goodness, some years before, my mother had asked Ruby and I to pray over her regarding Alzheimer's and, and uh, healing and, and regarding uh, another problem that had come uh, that I cannot recall the name of it at this moment, but um, a very serious malady, and uh, she was healed. Well, and then a stroke takes her away? Are you kidding? What's, what's going on here? So for two years, we went through this. And so I was saying to my sister one day on the phone, after the funeral's over, and I'm back in, in Chattanooga, I don't understand how the Lord allowed this to happen. You know that familiar story that probably all of you have told somebody else along the way. I don't understand how God did, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know. And my sister said, I understand perfectly well why. It took two years. And I said, yeah, sit on him. And he said, listen, if you're going to get too happy in this service, we're going to have to do something about it. And he is happy, I think. Um, and so she said, I know the reason why. It took two years. No kidding. Because we hadn't had a good relationship. And I needed that time. I needed that time. And Mom and I would talk in our good days. Didn't have... Every day was not good, but she had good days. We'd talk. We'd understand. We'd love each other. And if she had died suddenly, Ed, I would be plagued with this guilt about my relationship with my mother the rest of my life. And now I'm not. Now I know. And I was so glad to hear it. That didn't make it any easier. But you know... Peter had this terrible problem. Do, do you maybe recall what Peter's terrible problem was? Go with me to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. And go with me to verse 15. Now, this is very familiar, and I know you already know this story. Uh, so what? Uh, look at me at verse 15. Simon Peter followed Jesus. He had been arrested, carried off to the high priest's residence. So Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple, which, you know, is code language for John. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the room, into the court of the high priest, and Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. So now he's in the courtyard of the high priest. 
And the servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of the man's disciples, are you? <laughs> she recognized him. And he said, I am not. And the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. And Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. Uh, John uses that phrase to tell us something about Peter. <laughs> because the next time you see it is in verse 25. John 18, verse 25. Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. And they said to him, you also are not one of the disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. And one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose car, whose here Peter had cut off. Uh, apparently, apparently Parker has a car down here. And I got sidetracked on the man whose car Peter had cut. The man whose ear Peter had cut off asked, didn't I see you in the garden with him? And Peter again denied it. And at once, you know what happened next, don't you? The rooster crowed. Oh, you may not have been standing in the courtyard of the high priest denying that you knew Jesus when after all you had been one of his greatest disciples, one of his greatest friends. But he had betrayed the Lord. That's how he saw it. Because that was the truth, wasn't it? And the rooster crows. Do you know why the Lord assigned a rooster that job? Somebody has to stop us in our stupidity. And so God assigned a rooster somewhere in that vicinity. Let him know that he's wrong. He's going to have to back up. Sometimes you've had a rooster crow, I'll bet. I have. Only stupid people don't listen when a rooster crows. At least the roosters, I mean, that God sends. But Peter listened. It stopped him short. And he went out and repented. Well, now, back in John 21. You go back with, it, with me. John 21. You remember in verse 14 that this is the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And it wasn't all of them. It was just seven guys. But they were all headed up by Peter, you know, as usual. And in verse 15, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus, Simon Peter, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? I'm not sure what he was referring to these, but I'm guessing is do you love me more than what you're doing today? You know, commercial fishing with a net, hauling in a huge catch of fish, being successful. No more problems. No more who cares what the Jewish authorities think of you. No more theology. No more dealing with what God likes or doesn't like. Just do your job. Just do your job. Do you love me more than these? And the word that Jesus used in the Greek Testament is agape. There are several words for love in the Greek language. Um, we've only got a, we've only got a, we've only got a couple of words in English, love and lust. But that's but Greek has several words for love, and agape is the highest form. It is the love that God gives in us. It is the love that we sense when we know God loves us, and the way He loves us is without reservations completely committed to us. That's agape. But Peter answers him, yes, Lord, you know I love you, but he uses a different word, phileo. It is, um, it is a word that has to do with brotherly love. I love you like a friend. Maybe my best friend. That's phileo. 
And he said to him, then feed my lambs. In other words, take care of my church. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Agape again. And he says back to him, yes, Lord, you know I phileo you like a brother. He said to him, tend my sheep. The third time, Simon, the son of John, says, do you love me? And it has to do with Jesus changes his thought here from the love of God to the phileo. Then Peter, do you love me? And I think what he's really saying here is, do you love me as much as you can today? Because he'd already realized this is as much as Peter's going to get. This is as good as it's going to get. Because the poor guy was beaten down. And you know what he was beaten down about? Not a night fishing. If you were used to that. He was beaten down by his own cowardice. By the fact that he had denied the Lord three times. And that's why Jesus came to him. You know that whole breakfast on the side of the lake. Do you think that was because they needed, uh, they needed something from McDonald's to, to finish the day? No. That it needed fish and bread? No. No, that was just the before meeting. The real business at hand was, do you love me, Peter? Need an answer, boy. Need an answer. Uh, sure, I love you. Sure. Well, then, do you love me then? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thirdly, have we got an understanding here that you love me <laughs> as much as you can? And, of course, Peter says, that's where I am. That's what I can do. You know, not one time did Jesus say to him, you have been a coward. You have denied me three times. You are not worthy to be an apostle of the church. You are a terrible man. You might be big, but you're tiny in your heart. You, you cannot be part of this assembly. Never one time said any of that. Any of that. He comes back to him with three assurances. If you love me at all, you need to tend my sheep. You need to love my church. The people who are coming after me is whom you need to love. I want, to, I, want to, I want to take you back to another passage. Just hang on to, to John 21 and Luke 22. Go with me to Luke, Luke 22. It, listen, listen. Tell him to quit having a good time. Luke 22, verse 31. Y'all there? Jesus is trying to tell Peter what's coming next. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you. That's plural. The old King James Bible used a different set of pronouns along the way. Thee and thou. And you knew when you said thee, it was plural, and thou was singular. Well, we don't have that in the modern English, so you have to get, understand. This whole, behold, Simon has demanded to have you, that is, all of you, all of his disciples. I guess in the southern way, you could say you all. Satan has demanded to have you all, that he might sift you all like wheat. But I have prayed for you, now it's singular. I prayed for you, Peter, that your, Peter, your faith may not fail. And when you, singular again, when you, Peter, have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And of course, Peter, being who he is, says back to the Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. How ready do you think he was? No. 
Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Boy, you got to hand it to Jesus about this, Buster. He will tell you exactly how it is. You may not like it. You may not want it. But you can always count on him to tell you exactly what it is. Exactly what you are. I'll go with you anywhere, Lord. No, you won't. Oh, I'll, I'll never deny you. Yes, you will. And there's a rooster in your future. What's Peter supposed to do with that? Listen to the rooster. Don't deny me three times. Don't do that. God will condemn you. He never said that one time. I'm telling you, I'm prophesying to you, Peter. Here's what's going to happen. You can't help this, friend. This is you all over. <laughs> You're going to do three disgusting things in the court of the high priest, and you're going to regret it for a long time to come. But listen, listen to the rooster. Once that rooster crows, that Peter is going to die. And I need to tell you something that is both honest and heartbreaking all at the same time. You must die. You must get finished with you. You cannot be the arrogant person that you got born to be and stay the place where it is going to have to be for you to do something for God in this life. You cannot stay the ignorant arrogant, self-centered person that all of us are. Something has to die. That's the, that's the place where the rooster has. When the rooster crows, it means you're finished. And Peter was finished. But what comes out of that always is I'm at the end of my dreams and so there's nothing left for me. I can't be an apostle in the church. I can't be a disciple that follows Jesus. I can't be a part of his fellowship. I've already I've thrown it away. You ever do something in your life where you felt like, you know, in my insane moments, I have thrown something away. I know people who are divorced who know that. Messing around with somebody else, third party in a marriage, that always, listen, that always ends badly, one way or the other. <laughs> You've got to end something. And so I'm just saying to you, listen to me. When Jesus says, do you love me? He's saying the very same thing to you at the end of every saga that you've had in your life where you have denied the Lord, where you've walked away, where you have let your self-centeredness take charge over everything that God wants for your life. And you and I both know this, don't we? that you know the moment when the rooster crowed. You know. You know. So Jesus comes to you by the form of his Holy Spirit, like he came to Peter. Because listen to me. This is the wonderful thing. I want to say this to you, and I want you to hear it. God never gives up. He never quits. He never backs up and he never loses the battle. Oh, you might say he's lost this or he's lost that. Listen, that's very temporary. After everything is said and done, he never loses. Never loses. Never loses. And I know people who have quit this life way early on from what they should have. And I'm sure when they got to glory, the Lord said to them, what in the world were you thinking? Why are you here now? But the truth of the matter is, listen to me, he took him in anyway. Because he never quits and he never ends and he never, ever throws us away. I am surprised when churches throw people away. I know what Paul says. And Paul was talking truth. Be careful about these people because they 
this, uh, they've done this or they've done that, and you shouldn't have fellowship with these people. I know all that. I know all that. Do you know when people screw up in a church? Do you honestly think they come every Sunday then with their, with their smiles on their face and their Bibles open? No, they stay home. <laughs> they don't want anything to do with me or you. Now they've screwed up. They're out there somewhere. You don't have to throw them out. They'll get out. They'll, just, they'll leave. You've got to go find them. <laughs> that's the problem. You've got to go find them. You know, that's what Jesus said. I don't need to call the 99 righteous ones. I've got to go find the sheep that's lost. That's the job of the shepherd. Find the sheep that are lost. And so Peter was lost. He didn't look like it. He didn't talk like it. He didn't seem like it. But listen, when he said, I'm going fishing, what that meant was, I'm through with this. But he wasn't through with that because God wasn't going to let him be through with that. Listen to me, Peter, in Luke 5, Jesus says, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to catch men. And from that moment of John 21 to the rest of his life, Peter was an apostle of the church, called men to Christ. But that story didn't end there. Jesus says to him, after he talked to him three times in, in Luke 21, I'm saying to you that when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you're old, you will... You will Stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And this, he said, to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying that, he said to him, follow me. You might be thinking, what a sad thing that Jesus would say to Peter, listen, you're going to be a martyr. Is that because Peter had earned the privilege of dying when he didn't want to die? that God was mad at him and so therefore he had to be suffering because he had been a rascal to deny Jesus three times? That isn't what it means at all. What it means is that the great fear in Peter's life is that he would turn on the Lord again someday. That he would not be faithful. That he would not be a, a courageous leader. That he would be somebody who would just walk off one day when he felt like it, when he was tired, when he was, ha when he was uh, sad, when he was sinful, whatever he was. No, no. The assurance that Jesus was giving him is this. Peter, you're going to serve me faithfully for the rest of your life. And when you're an old man, they'll come and get you and you will die a martyr's death. Church history, tradition tells us that Peter, when he was an old man in Rome, under Nero was crucified but he requested of the authorities that he not die in crucifixion like Jesus had died but that they would crucify him upside down instead and they did and they killed both Peter and his wife in the Roman circus just down the way from where the Vatican stands today. And the big pillar that stood in the Roman circus with the emperor on top of it was brought eventually up to Vatican Hill and placed in the courtyard of the Vatican itself. And there it sits now as a memorial to Peter's death. You'll be faithful. What do you got to do now? What's the next step, Peter? Jesus just simply said, follow me. Just put one foot in front of the other and follow me. Let's pray together. We're asking, Father, in Christ's name, that Jesus Christ would reveal himself to us in our lives in the times when we may need you the most, in the times when we are simply, simply, sinful people who have decided to go our own ways. May you prevent us by the cock crowing for us from walking away from what God has promised his people. In the name of Jesus Christ, we're praying together. May you do this for us now. Amen.